which camera should I buy? I'm going to answer it for a wide variety of people, people who just want general stills and video throughout their lives. That's most people. And then specialized people who want to shoot vlogging or other types of video, landscapes, portraits, wildlife, sports. You can look at the description and jump that jump to the part of the video that is right for you if you have a specific question. First, I want to plug my own books. I'm the author of Stunning Digital Photography, the number one photography book in the world, as well as books on Lightroom, Photoshop, and camera gear. You can check everything out at sdp.io slash store. And learning photography is going to make a way bigger difference in the photos that, that, that you produce than buying new camera gear. Anyway, let's get started going through this. First of all, many of you are avid followers of our channel. You're deep into photography already. You are not looking to buy your first camera. This video is for people buying their first camera. If you want to understand the logic behind my recommendations, I will go on at length on this companion video here, kind of a behind the scenes to this buying guide video. The first question you have to ask yourself if you're buying a camera is, should you even buy a camera? Because we all have smartphones nowadays and smartphones are really good. I talk to a lot of people, not serious photographers, but casual photographers who buy a camera and they use it for a month. Then they go back to just using their smartphone and they tell me, well, my smartphone takes a really good pictures and the camera I bought was kind of a pain to use. But at that point, they've sunk $500, $1,000, $1,500 into this camera that then collects dust and never really gets used. And I I, that, I feel, would feel really bad if I told people to buy a camera and then it just ended up collecting dust. If you're planning to spend $500 on a camera, spend $500 more on a smartphone that has a really good camera built into it, like the newest generation of iPhones are really good. This Pixel 3 has a great camera in it. Most new smartphones have great cameras in them. and they will take better pictures than a $500 camera and the kit lens. If you're the type who's only ever going to use the camera, the, the lens that came with your basic camera, you're probably better off with a smartphone. Cameras come with a lot of overhead, the need to transfer the pictures and video from your camera to your smartphone. Sure, there are apps that do it, but it's still a real pain. You can't do things like live streaming or direct Instagramming from a camera. You would still end up using your smartphone like this. The screen on your smartphone is bigger and more beautiful than it's going to be on the camera. However, if you want to get into the into the hobby of photography, if you want to collect some different lenses, if you want to learn the difference between f2.8 and f5.6, then you should get a real camera. If you're into sports photography or wildlife photography, your smartphone really sucks at those things, so you should get a camera. If you wanna get into serious portraiture, maybe make some money on it, then you should get a real camera. So let's say you want the cheapest possible camera. I'm gonna recommend a used Canon T3 that you can pick up for about 200 bucks. This is probably the number one camera for photography students who just got a college class and their professor says they need to get a camera. It's a capable camera. It can take a wide variety of Canon DSLR lenses. And like I said, it's $200, but it is primitive. When you use it, you will long for your smartphone. The focusing is slow. It only has a couple of focusing points in the middle. Pictures won't be as good as that from your smartphone. Nonetheless, it's a real camera with capable manual controls. A step up from that, if you have a few more bucks, would be a used D5500 or D5600. The image quality is going to be a little bit better than the T3. They offer a flip screen, which is a big difference for people who might be shooting video, who might want to take selfies with it. The difference between the D5500, the older generation, and the D5600 is that the D5600 has a touch screen. And I know most people buying their first camera have gotten used to the touch screen on their smartphone the D5500 lacks that, and the first thing people do is poke at the screen with their finger and it doesn't care, but the D5600 adds that feature. So for an extra 100 bucks or so, you might consider upgrading for that. If you have a few more bucks to, to spend, a camera that is fun to use, that offers a great experience, is the Fujifilm X-T20. It has manual dials on the top that actually show you the shutter speed in an analog way, as well as analog markings on the lens for the f-stop. It's just... It's a fantastic photography experience and the images are good. You're not going to see a huge step up from your smartphone until you actually swap the kit lens out and put on some other lenses. But Fuji has a wide variety of really fantastic lenses. So you are capable of upgrading and getting that better image quality. By the way, all of this is spoken from experience. We are lucky to be in the position of being camera reviewers. We test just about every new camera that comes out. We are one of the few channels that is completely 
uh, unbiased. We do not accept money or free camera gear from camera or lens manufacturers. So this is our honest recommendation and what we think is best for the viewers. A step up from that, if you're willing to spend a, f a little bit more money, I'm going to give you a couple of options here. A used Fujifilm X-T2, which you can pick up for $1,400. Like the previous Fuji, it offers like fantastic manual controls and really a great photography experience. If you're getting, uh, if you're thinking about being more serious, maybe you want to get into portrait or wedding photography, a Nikon D750 with a lens, I would recommend the longer kit lens, the 24 to 120 here. Um, that'll go, that kit will go for about $1,800. It's a full frame camera. It has a bigger sensor, which means especially in low light, you're going to get um, better images, um, especially in base ISO. When, when you have lots of sunlight, I should say, you will get a little bit cleaner images. So the image quality here is better and you have a wider variety of options you can upgrade to if you choose to. The X-T2, generally more fun. If you can spend $2,500, Fuji's latest camera, the X-T3, is really a marvel. Um, pair it with the 16 to 55 f2.8 if you can. It's a fantastic all around stills and video camera and the most fun camera that I've ever used. If you have a few more bucks at $3,300, I would put you into a Sony A7 Mark III with their Sony 24 to 105 G lens. This is a fantastic combination. It does not come cheap, but this is a combination that is capable of producing professional grade stills and video. It is kind of a jack of all trades. It can do sports, it can do some wildlife, and it can do wedding video. Like this is what professional photographers use. If you have that kind of cash, it's fantastic. If you can spend even more money, here are the top grade cameras, the ones that we use when we go do something serious, the Sony a7R three. Again, I would probably start you out with a 24 to 105 f4 sony lens a fantastic lens or the nikon d850 and i would pair that with the nikon 24 to 70 vr with the stabilization they produce very very similar results these cameras are very similar in so many ways but they function very differently the sony on the left is a mirrorless camera which means it has an electronic viewfinder it is a little more sophisticated and a little bit nerdier than nikon is big and chunky and durable. It has big fat buttons on it. It feels great in your hands, but it's also much heavier. It has like an old style optical viewfinder, the kind that have been on camera since the fifties or sixties. So it's less nerdy and more like rugged and durable. So pick which one matches your personality. Once you do buy a camera, I recommend watching a tutorial to get the most out of the camera. We have a series of over 50 one hour videos at stp.io slash tutorials that is completely free. Let's say you want to shoot landscape photography. I'm going to go through those recommendations. Now, um, landscape photography is different from just general photography in that generally you're, you're shooting to make a print and you want the print to be sharp. You don't need fast autofocus because usually you're manually focusing on things, but you want as much detail as possible. You might also be shooting things like stars. So you might be working in low light. At the base end, I would recommend the Nikon D5500 with the Sigma 18-35 f1.8 lens. That's a fantastic combination that can produce basically full frame results at a low end price of around $1,000 used. A step up from that is a used D800E. This camera is a couple of generations old, and that's what makes it such a fantastic value used. I would also recommend the third party Tamron 24-70 f2.8 lens. You can get the older generation model. The optics are still, still fantastic. And that you can get all that for $1,700 and that's 36 megapixels. Very, very sharp. If you have more money to spend the previous generation, Sony, the Sony a7R2 paired with the Sony 16 to 35 G master will produce absolutely stunning results. Be sure to grab several extra batteries for this setup. Like we would travel with four or five batteries because it can be difficult. The battery life is terrible. This is notable because the Sony 16 to 35 G master lens is extremely sharp. It completely blew away every other uh, landscape lens we ever tested. Still more money than that. If you're willing to spend $5,000, the step up the newest generation Sony, the Sony A7R Mark III has a cool pixel shift feature that can take its 42 megapixel sensor and move it and produces like absolutely stunning landscape photos that seem to beat anything else we've ever tested when, when paired with this amazing 16 to 35 G master lens. 
Let's say you want to shoot sports. I shoot sports all the time because my kid plays soccer like three times a week. So I have tested all these cameras and I'm pretty serious about it. Uh, if you're at the low end of the budget um, and you want to spend as little as possible, I would put you into a Canon T6i with their kit lens, the 18-135 to kit lens. This is a great combination and will produce much better results than you could possibly get with your smartphone. If you're willing to spend some more money, I would buy a used Canon 7D, the original, and pair it with a used Tamron 70-200 f2.8. This will bring you closer to the subjects, give you more background blur, and it will genuinely produce pro-grade results that you can send to the friends and make pretty big prints out of, and they'll look fantastic. And that combination is under a grand. If you can spend a little more, I would keep the same, same lens, but upgrade you to the Canon 7D Mark II, which is just a newer generation and is generally a better body. Um, check the used prices, see the difference between the original 7D and the 7D Mark II, and pick the one that fits your budget the best. If you can step up, I would switch you over to the Nikon world because the Nikon D500 is one of the best sports cameras ever made. And I would pair that again with the Tamron 70-200 f2.8. Um, together, those are going to cost you a little bit under $2,000 if you get them used. The D500 is exceptionally durable, so you can pick up a used copy and it should be just fine. If you're willing to spend some more and maybe you like a little higher tech experience, this gives you an electronic viewfinder with no blackout. The Fujifilm X-T3 is one of the most amazing sports cameras I've ever used. Pair it with the Fuji 15 to 140 f2.8. And if you plan to be shooting longer distances, you might consider getting their 1.4 times teleconverter for that combination. It's great. If your budget is essentially unlimited and you're willing to spend upwards of $5,000, the gear that I bring when I can pick any camera is the Sony A9, which sells for about $3,400 new, and the Sony 70-200G Master, often with a 1.5, 1.4 teleconverter on it. It's absolutely stunning. It produces a true 20 frames per second with no viewfinder blackout. Portraits. You want to take pictures of people, and maybe you're thinking about going pro. Maybe you want to start to make the camera pay for itself. Maybe you just want to shoot friends and family for fun. I'm going to walk you through that at the entry level. I would get you into the Nikon world, put you in a D5300 with their 18 to 140 kit lens. It's pretty good, especially at the 140 end, at the long end, the telephoto lens, and you'll be able to produce really nice portraits that will probably look a little bit better than that, which you would get from your smartphone, but you still be able to zoom back for things like group shots, shooting events. Uh, I would also add the Nikon 50mm f1.8 G lens to that for about $160. It'll get you really nice bokeh. By the way, one of the benefits of having a real camera for portraiture is people will take you more seriously than if you're using your smartphone. Portrait mode on these produces good results that would rival these kit lenses in most cases. At least it's been the results of our testing, but people take you more seriously when you have a real camera. Spend a little bit more, and I would put you in a full-frame Nikon D610, get it used, and again, I would pair it with the excellent Tamron 70-200 f2.8. That'll cost you about $1,300. Step up again, and I would I would put you in the newer generation Tamron lens, and uh, a step up from that is the Nikon D750. The D750 adds two card slots, so you can write simultaneously. That way, if one card fails, you haven't lost the portrait session or the wedding. Really, this is what... The D750 is what like most pros seem to be using when they get into the field, that or the Canon equivalent of it. It's an excellent pro-grade camera that can kind of do it all. A step up from that is the Sony a7 III with the Sony 70-200G Master. This adds eye detect autofocus, which can really make the entire portrait shoot go much faster by automatically finding the subject's eye and focusing on it. And I really like that about it. Otherwise, you probably won't notice too much of a difference in the actual photos. It's more about the workflow and the speed of it all. And if you step up to the A7R Mark III, it'll cost you more, but this will produce higher resolution images that you can print bigger or crop deeper into. Again, most portrait photographers probably wouldn't know the difference, but uh, if you ever plan to actually like sell images or make them bigger, you would start to see some difference here. Um, they're both also really good for video. Let's say you want to shoot wildlife, one of my favorite subjects. 
you can't do that with your phone at all because you just can't get close enough. You need a big telephoto lens, like ideally that one. But I'm going to start you out a little bit cheaper. Here's a setup that comes in under $1,000 now for the camera and the body. And this was my own personal setup for years. The Canon 7D original one, which sells for like 250 bucks now. And then the Canon 400 millimeter F56 Prime. These will produce pro grade results. Step up to the Canon 7D Mark II, and the camera is a little bit faster. The focusing points go out a little bit farther, and it's just generally better, but I would keep that same used lens. If you can step up to $2,200 used, I would switch you over to the Nikon D500, which offers 10 frames per second, generally focuses better and faster, and it would put you in the excellent 200 to 500 zoom lens. If you can spend a little bit more, we just tested out the Nikon 500 millimeter F56, and it's a good upgrade from that 200 to 500 zoom lens. Of course, now you're looking at upwards of $5,000, but this setup will allow you to track fast moving birds uh, with an amazing hit rate. It is truly a pro grade combination that is still mostly carryable. It's heavy, but it's definitely carryable. And a step up from that is what we have here. Uh, it's fantastic. It's really, I think, produces the best wildlife imagery you can possibly produce at this point in history. The Nikon D850, put the vertical grip on it so you can get the fastest possible frames per second out of it with the Nikon 600 millimeter F4. If you're doing wildlife video, that combination also works pretty well too. We often pair it with a teleconverter to get the most out of it. Let's say you want to be a vlogger. This is a really common question. It turns out I have a YouTube channel. I know a little bit about this. So let's go over vlogging cameras. I'm gonna separate this from people who just wanna shoot video. So when I say vlogging, I mean people filming themselves. You do not have a separate camera person. That's very different from somebody who is actually a cameraman working behind the camera filming things over here. If the camera's pointed towards you, check out my vlogging recommendations. If the camera's always pointed away from you, wait until the next section. At the base end, around $600, I'm gonna put you in a Canon M50. It has amazing dual pixel autofocus that will automatically find your face and that can be a big deal. If you wanna spend less than that, you know what I would do is again, I would just use your smartphone and perhaps buy a gimbal. Put, a, put your camera on a gimbal, it works like a selfie stick but it stabilizes it so you can get nice tracking shots and just film yourself with your smartphone. We do that a lot anyway because it's convenient and we mix it into our pro grade videos and nobody complains it looks just fine a step up from that is a little more versatile camera the sony rx100 mark 6 we did a full review on it you can check it on our channel it has a flip up screen so you can see yourself and it does a good job of focusing on your face at wide angles you're not going to see a huge difference between the video that this puts out and that from your smartphone but it can zoom in so it provides that additional versatility um, what we actually use for vlogging is the Canon EOS R camera with the kit lens will cost you about $3,400. We actually pair it with the $100 EOS R adapter and the Canon 24 millimeter F1.4 so we can get really nice full frame bokeh. Check out our, our vlogging videos and specifically look up this camera and you'll see that the, it really produces excellent results. Most importantly, it does a flip screen so you can see yourself and it will actually autofocus reliably on your face without moving around. It's not the perfect camera, but it does a better job of that type of filming than anything we've tested. Which camera should you buy for video? Again, this is when you're behind the camera and not in front of the camera. When you have a dedicated camera person, this is the way we've been shooting for many years. At the base end, I'd put you in the Panasonic FZ300. It does not have an interchangeable lens. It's fixed lens, but it's really versatile. It does 4K and overall works really well. A step up from that is the G7 with interchangeable lenses, meaning you can put on a variety of different lenses. If you're gonna be adding things for shallow depth of field or whatever, this is the way to go. But the best starting lens, the one we love, is the Panasonic 14 to 140. And that'll put you closer to $1,000, but you have more room to upgrade in the future. You can't really upgrade the previous camera. A step up from that is our previous A-roll camera, the Panasonic GH4 with that same lens. Again, at some point you'll wanna to upgrade to super wide angle lenses or really fast primes to get background blur but this is a great starting point. One thing to note about all these cameras is they do not have good autofocus. You cannot track moving subjects. You cannot plan to put yourself in front of the camera and have it find your face reliably. It's not going to work that well, but they are good pro-grade video cameras for times when you have a camera operator. 
The Fujifilm X-T3 is new and with a lens warning you about 2,500 bucks, uh, but it does 4K at 60 frames per second, which none of the previous cameras can do. It has fantastic autofocus and uh, it's generally great, but the screen does not flip towards you at all. If it did, it would be an awesome vlogging camera, but it does not. We use as our A-roll camera, the Panasonic GH5, and we have for more than a year now. It produces a beautiful 4K 60 frames per second video. We do not use any of the Panasonic lenses on a day-to-day -day basis. Our go-to lens is the Sigma 18 to 35 in a Canon mount. And then we adapt it with the Metabones 7.1 times or 1.7 times teleconverter that you can pick up here. Um, not a teleconverter, but a speed booster. This combination is weird and does not autofocus well at all. But for times when you're manually focusing and everything, it produces like really better than full frame results, including great low light video. It's just, it's a workhorse. It can record video to two memory cards, which the previous cameras could not do. That way, if one fails, you have that backup and it can record for an unlimited amount of time. It's just a fantastic all around video camera. A camera that a lot of wedding photographers and wedding videographers are using now is the Sony a7 III, which is a fantastic video camera with amazing autofocus. It lacks that flip forward screen, so it's not easy to use it to film yourself. But if you're filming other people, especially tracking movement, I would recommend this over the GH5. Um, that pretty much wraps it up. If you have any questions, ask them in the comments down below. If you're angry that I didn't recommend your camera, again, I'm going to point you back to this link here. Uh, let me get to it. Oh man, I got so many frames. Wow, this is quite a journey. Okay, go to this link here before you get angry and you can listen to me explain myself and then you can get angry here. <laughs> Thanks. And don't forget to check out our store at northrop.photo where you can pick up the best video and book training. All these books have videos built into them, 14 hours of video and stunning digital photography. It's the best place to start and it all starts at less than 10 bucks. Thanks so much. Oh, and subscribe because our videos are free and we're going to have a ton of them and teach you how to, we'll teach you how to take great pictures. Thanks.